Does your world feel heavy and dark? We live in a world of commotion and noise, and sometimes we just need a little reminder that there is more light than we can even imagine. Hi, and welcome to Magnify, an LDS Living podcast where we cheer, inspire, and embolden each other as women and followers of Christ. We hope to use our influence to make a difference in the world. I'm your host, Katherine Davis, a mom, a seminary teacher, and a grilling enthusiast who loves God. Today's guest is artist Kate Lee, and she understands how it feels to be in that darkness. She created a painting called Through His Light that came from a place of recognizing that there was more light from Christ all around her. And today, Kate is going to share three lessons she learned through the process of creating that painting. But before we talk to her about her painting, it has become a tradition on Magnify Podcast to do a couple of rapid fire questions to get to know our guests a little bit better. And Kate, I have three questions for you. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. You are a fantastic artist and have some amazing paintings that you create of Christ. You mostly work with watercolor as your main medium. Mm -hmm. But what is another medium you really love or would want to use or improve on? Oh my goodness. I love, love pencil and charcoal. That's like something I love to get into it because you get nitty and gritty and dirty and it like stains your fingers. And like, I love, that sounds so dumb, but I, I love, love that. Like I crave that. So I love watercolor so much. And that is a very close second. So do you do that a lot? Not as much as I'd like to. I, I do it, but because I'm so busy with the, the projects with Desert Book, I don't get to do it as much as I would like to. So one of these days, I'm going to have two studios, one for my water. <laughs> that's unrealistic, but one for my watercolors and one for my charcoals and pencils. So I can just get messy in there and clean in this one because they're very different, you know, so. Okay. I also know that you are an avid biker yes, and that you have invited me to come along with you sometime, but Mm -hmm. that is a little scary to me Yes, because you're kind of the queen at it. So I want to know what is your favorite trail that you've ever biked and what is a trail that you really, really want to do? My favorite trail. First of all, Catherine, one of these days I'm going to get you to go with me because you'll love it. Um, (laughs) But my favorite trail all-time favorite is called Spinal Tap. You can shuttle it. It's all downhill. So you can either get it shuttled or it's 10 miles of uphill and then like 16 miles of downhill, but absolutely worth it. It is, it's a black line. It's chunky. It's long. It's just like, it's like you're on the verge of death, but it's so fun the whole entire time. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> so I don't know if that sounds fun to be yeah. on the verge of death the entire time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one wrong move and you could be seriously injured or die, but it's so worth it. (laughs) Oh my word. (laughs) Here is another question that I have for you that I've actually wondered about for a long time. A lot of your paintings are focused on the savior. Mm -hmm. And so I want to know when you paint the savior, where does your inspiration come from? How do you see him? What inspires you? Mostly it comes from, I would say conversation with people, different conversations. Like when people are sharing, when I'm at Time Out for Women and people like these sweet women are telling me their experiences, I see in images, you know, so like when somebody's telling me a story, it's like a movie in my head. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of the time they're sharing these really tender experiences with me and ideas come from those experiences they share with me. Or another huge way is that when I'm reading my scriptures, like this year we're studying the New Testament and I've been watching the chosen right along with it, you know, and it is just by like reading the scriptures and there's like a couple of words together. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally want to paint those two words and, and what it would represent, you know? And so it's really scripture and, and conversation are the two biggest inspirations. So has the way you've painted the savior changed over the years? Yes. Oh yeah. I wanted to be a cartoonist. So I used to draw him as a cartoon, right? And then I got home from my mission okay. and that shifted from cartooning to, I wanted to try ultra realism, which I'm not good at, but I did. I tried to do all the details, you know, and then that shifted to this minimalistic style. And it just kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. It just kind of flowed into what it is, you know? Obviously, cartooning is just funny and silly, but the ultra realistic for me, it wasn't very personal, but that I, I don't, I hope that makes sense. But with 
this, this minimalistic style for me, it became very personal because it became the savior and how my relationship was with the savior. And, and that's what I want people to feel when they see the paintings of Christ. I want them to be able to feel their relationship with the savior. So I hope that's what comes out. Kate, I love that. And I think that's why I love your art. And that is one of the reasons that I want to talk a little bit about your painting through his light is just this beautiful painting. I love the color blue, how blue is on the outsides. And it's just this young girl who is kneeling in front of the savior and they both have their hands out and he is giving her light and there's light that comes up from the center of them. That is one of my favorite paintings Thank you. of the savior and one that you've done. Can you tell me the story behind that? Uh, of course. It actually is my very favorite painting of all of them, just because it, it really is my story. It was born out of distress. It was born out of this really dark moment, you know, back in 2016, that whole year was just filled with depression. And that's something that I struggle with anyways, depression. But that year was one of the heaviest, heaviest years of depression that I had ever experienced, like ever in my life. Like I felt like I was trying to find ways to find who I was and find a purpose and find a place. But then I felt like any effort that I was giving it, I was doing it wrong. Like I wasn't doing yeah. anything right, you know? And I felt like God was mad at me and Christ was disappointed with me. And like, I just felt like, I just didn't have a place, you know, and I felt like as time went on, because I wasn't doing these things right, that depression just got really, 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 really heavy. And by mid-December of that year, there's some morning I sent my boys to school, Mike went off to work and I just couldn't do it anymore. I was so done being, I'm going to get emotional, but I was so done being a failure. And I remember I was just at the top of our stairs. And I just started to sob like I was just bawling. And I remember feeling like I was broken. I had no aim, no direction, you know, and, and I felt forgotten. Um, and I remember pleading with God, can you be with me? Yeah. Do you not see that I'm suffering? Do you not see that this has been a full year of this and you're not with me? And I remember asking him, can you just be with me right now? And I waited to feel that. And I didn't feel anything and I remember being almost like, of course, he's not going to come to me. Of course, I'm not worthy of that. So of course, he's not going to be in this moment with me. And I don't know how long I laid there. Just like I cried so much that I couldn't cry anymore, you know. And then it was probably, I don't even know, like an hour or two before the boys were supposed to get home from school. And I remember I, I told myself, you need to get up, Kate. Like, you need to get up. You need to keep going. And specifically saying to myself, your family is going to be home and they need you. So you need to get up. I didn't really want to get up. Like it mm -hmm. felt safer to lay on the floor and just stay there and kind of give up on things. But I knew I needed to get up because I didn't want my boys to see me that way. I didn't want Mike to see me that way. And so with everything inside of me that I could find, whatever mental, physical strength, I got up. And I remember just praying really hard to just, can you just help me make it to bedtime? Like, just help me make it through, you know, it was just a hard day. And then I just kind of went into survival mode and I kept going. And then it was a couple months after that experience that I was sitting in Relief Society. And I was just like, still like, I was sitting there with my head down and just wanting to give up. Um, when like suddenly this image of Christ sitting with this girl just kind of came into my mind and I was just like, oh my gosh, like, this is so beautiful. That's a beautiful image. I would love for that to be me. You know, I think like, I need Christ. Why isn't this me? And like, I reached in my, my church bag and I grabbed my journal and I grabbed my pencil and I started to draw this image because it was really tender yeah. and I wanted to remember it, you know? And so I started to draw it. And that moment when I started to draw this image, that is when the spirit helped me to understand. I feel like that's when my heart started to open to Christ because that is when the spirit helped me to understand that I had Christ, right? He was right there with me and he was waiting for me to turn to him. He was waiting for me to give him this load. He would take it for me if I would give it to him, but you know, I needed to give it to him. That hope and that peace that I'd been wanting forever, what felt like forever, felt like 
it's right here. Like this sketch, this is that light that I want, you know? And so I went home and I went into my studio and I drew it out and I painted it. And it just was this moment that I wish everybody could have been in my studio with me, but it was this moment of, oh my gosh, I can feel Christ with me right now. I can feel him telling me and teaching me that, that I'm known, that I'm loved, that that everything that I've been going through is understood, you know, that I haven't been yeah. fighting this battle alone. You know, it just was this great moment of learning who Christ is and that he's with me. And it's just something that yeah. it was just such a powerful, beautiful moment. And so that's why I love this painting so much. I wonder, Kate, if there were more moments of light along the way that could have been hard to recognize. Yeah. Until that moment sitting in Relief Society. And right. you talk about that day laying at the top of your stairs. And I think that moment when you got up, I think that is a moment where you were receiving light. Yeah. And receiving strength to get up. And I think sometimes we fail to see those moments of light. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do we sometimes fail to see those? I mean, I really think for myself, and maybe this is everyone, but I really feel like for myself, it's like, because we're so convinced on the negative, like we've told ourselves over and over, I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not good enough. And we're so focused on that, that any of that light that came or is coming our way, you know, it's hard to understand that God and Christ really want to be a part of our lives, right? You know, it's because we're focused on the negative, right? And we're not allowing that light and we're like blocking it because we're like, but God can't possibly love me. Like, doesn't he know what a failure I am? Doesn't he know what a bad mom I am? Doesn't he know, you know, all of these negative, 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 you know, but in those moments, we're failing to see all of the good that God sees in us. Yeah. And I wonder, sometimes I think we think in some moments that the light has to be like a light switch, yeah. right? This dramatic on and off. Right. And Elder Bednar talks a lot about that. He talks about like those light switch moments, but those are rare. Yeah. And he compares more of our experiences with the Holy Ghost and with understanding and feel God's love of like a sunrise, that it's, it's yeah. gradual. So it sounds like that moment in Release Society was more of a light switch moment for you, but was there a gradual increase that maybe was harder to see in the moment? Well, I think so. And I think even in that moment in Relief Society, I would say that that was not even a light switch moment. I think that that was like a gradual trust me moment. Hmm. Like, here's a little bit. I need you to trust me. And then we're going to go to that light switch moment together. I've looked back on 2016 a lot because it was such a pivotal year of growth for me. As I've looked back on that year, I'm like, oh, there's the light and there's a little bit of light and there's a light, you know? Interesting. Yeah. And it, it led to that moment in Relief Society, which was just, here's a little opening of light, you know? And then since then, it has been moments that have led to bigger light switch moments. Oh, and I love how Elder Bednar described it as a gradual sunrise. And sometimes it's so gradual and so constant that we don't notice it. Right. Yeah. And I think it's taking the time to notice that in our day-to-day -day life, noticing those gradual sunrise moments where we are communicating with our heavenly father. Right. And so I just wonder, how do you notice the light every day in your life? It is like, and every day is different because there are days that I'm really good at it. And there are days that I am not good at it at all. Like where I tend to fall back into the lies, you know, that Satan wants us to believe. So what does a good day look like? So on my mirror in my bathroom, there is, I, I have a dry erase marker and I have written words on that that are good, positive words to focus on. And so on a good day, I look at those words. And, and they say confidence, self-loving is another one. And listening is the third one. And that's giving myself grace, you know, like listening to myself and being confident with who I am in the moment. But anyway, I look at those words and I'm like, okay, I'm going to take those words and I'm going to go through my day. It's just like, where are my little successes here in this moment? Where did I succeed here? Yeah, maybe I lost my temper here, but I also was able to turn and say, I'm so sorry. and I love you here. It's just... Focusing on our little successes is what helps me to fill that light. And it takes practice telling yourself right. positive, good things because you're a positive, good person. And that's who God sees. 
So daily practice of telling yourself who God sees, trying to remind yourself of that. How else do you notice God's light in your life? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different things like go through and think of different people in my life that have been there. For example, Catherine, you have been a person in my life that has really helped me to feel light and understand light. You've brought positivity into my life and that has been huge for me, huge for me. Also in the scriptures, when I take the time to not just read the scriptures, but really listen to the scriptures, because there's a lot of beautiful things in there that that God and Christ are saying to us personally, you know? And so when I take the time to really listen is when I can feel that light. But I do think every day is different, you know, because sometimes it's like when I'm painting, I'm like, oh, I feel this. This is, and it not necessarily just a painting of Christ, any painting. You know, I'm like, oh, I feel this, you know, and doing what you love. Yeah. Yeah. And just yesterday I was doing the dishes, which is such a mundane thing. Our dishwasher's broken. And I was just this moment I'm washing. And I just had this moment of peace. I don't know, like, oh, I know I'm loved. Quick little moment, but it was a moment and it just really lifted my day. Right. And it's so easy. I think sometimes to miss those moments if we're not looking for them. Yeah. Yeah. And to miss God's hand in our life if we're not looking for them. I actually had a class the last month. They wanted to do this challenge where they want to talk about moments where they've seen God's hand in their life. And we kind of do a tally mark on the board. So they want to get the whole board filled up by the end of the semester. Right. And it has been so amazing for me to see all of these like 14 to 18 year olds talk about moments where they've seen God's hand in their life. And I think it would be so easy to miss Mm -hmm. if they weren't looking for them. In fact, I had one girl who came and said, Hey, you know, she wanted to share today before she shared. She said, I totally would have missed this if I hadn't had that in my mind to look for God's hand. And I think that's a practice that maybe we're not very good at. Oh, for sure we're not. I think because Satan is so loud. He's so in our faces with all of this stuff, right? Like he's just always telling us like, you are not good. And if we allow him to be, he is louder than what God and Christ. Right. Right. But I think the first step really is blocking or stopping that, like stop telling ourselves, yeah, I am a failure. Stop giving into that. Stop allowing those lies to like take up space in our heads, right? I love that your class is doing that because that's pushing all of the negative out of their minds and just allowing the light to fill it in and flow in and to Mm. take up the space so that Satan can't get in there, but only the light can be in there. And so it's going to be different for all of us, but I think we have to get into that habit of noticing God's light. And I love how you use sticky notes. And so if sticky notes work for you, or if like noticing it when you're doing the dishes or what you think is a mundane chore, God can be there in the everyday moments. For sure. And he wants to be in everyday moments, right? He's our father. He wants to be a part of all those moments, even the laundry or cleaning the bathroom. He's interested in our life. So he wants to be there with us. Because sometimes don't you think that's hard to believe is that he wants to be there in those moments? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because why would he want to? I mean, at least for me, I always thought, well, God is God. Like he has better things to worry about. He doesn't need to, like, he doesn't care about the little things that I'm doing. Or I'm so insignificant in the world of so many people, you know, but we're individuals to him and he sees that. And we need to know that. Yeah. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about how you came to know that. Okay. The three lessons that you've learned from painting through his light. Yes. One of the first lessons that you learned is how to trust Christ. What do you mean by that? Like what lessons have you learned about trusting him? I think that it is just a willingness to be open to Christ. So I love this scripture in Matthew 11, verse 29, when Christ invites us to come unto him and I will give you rest. That's just one of my very favorites. And that is one that can be really hard to not accept because we can feel so, you know, insignificant compared to the world. But that's when we need to trust. Like that's when humility comes into play and we need to set aside those insecurities and those unbeliefs that we have about ourselves, right? And Christ, when he says, come unto me, I will give you rest, he means it. I want to know when you say you've learned to turn to Christ and he will give you rest. What does rest look like for you? Rest. I would love for it to be snuggled in a warm bed with a really cozy blanket with nice cozy jammies, you know, like I would love that to be the rest. But I think the rest 
comes in knowing that Christ is with you, even in those really hard, dark, heavy days that you can walk forward with Christ. And that is the rest because it's comforting to know you have somebody with you. And whether it's a hard moment, whether it's a great moment, whether it's a mess, like you made a mistake moment, you know, Christ is not yeah. turn his back on you. He's going to be right there with you to, to carry you and, and, and hold you up and walk you through it. And for me, that is rest. Rest is knowing that he'll be with us. So I think of you on the top of your stairs. Mm-hmm. And finding rest to get up and keep going. Even though it's hard. And you're right. There are times we don't recognize it, but he's with us. And I don't think I could have gone up off of those stairs without Christ being right there with me. Even though I didn't recognize him being with me, he was with me. So, Before you were saying that you didn't trust that you were worthy to give your burdens to Christ. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So I didn't grow up with a lot of self-confidence. You know, I just didn't believe in myself. I really felt very less than everybody else. And I didn't feel worthy of people's time or attention or any of that, you know? So with Christ, I just didn't trust that I was worthy of giving him anything of me. Like, why would he care about me? Because I'm not that important, you know? So I, I'm not going to try and turn hmm. to somebody. And this is what I believed. I'm not going to turn to Christ because he's not interested in me. He's not going to take these burdens from me because I'm not important enough, you know, so I'm just going to hold on to him and I'm just going to stuff him down deep. And I kind of felt like I was holding on to all of these mistakes and heartbreaks and disappointments and everything, like just these wounds and they were weighing me down. And so I wasn't giving any of that to Christ. I wasn't turning to him like, can you take some of these for me? Because you felt unworthy of... Uh, of anything. I mean, like I said, I just, I didn't feel like he was in it for me, that I was alone in this. And no matter what people would say to me or tell me like in Young Women's or whatever, I didn't believe that that was something that was for me individually, that I just kind of am skipped in the atonement. And I think a lot of people feel that way, Kate. I think a lot of people feel like, oh, that is for so-and-so because they can make a difference or yeah. they are this or that or that, right? Right. And that it's not for me. Right. Because I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough. Right. And those are lies. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. How'd you overcome that? What changed for you? For so long, I wasn't allowing any light in at all. I felt like I was a failure and there was nothing I could do to not be a failure. And so I had convinced myself, I just have to find a way to accept who I am as a failure you know, but there's nothing more for me. That's just who I am. And then the first time that changed for me was when I visited with my stake president. That's a story I've shared before, but that is when the light switch went on, but it was little moments that led to the change of, I'm not a failure. I wasn't sent here to be a failure. I was sent here with purpose, you know, I was sent here to share this and this and this and this, you know, and I was just so tired of living my life feeling like I didn't matter. And I knew that I needed to seek change. And so meeting with him was that change Mm -hmm. that I needed so that I could feel Christ and trust Christ and have Christ and understand, you know, that his atonement also applies to me as an individual. I think that's the difference, learning to trust him, that his atonement is for you Mm -hmm. and not just everybody else. I think that's such a powerful lesson which I think kind of leads into the second lesson that you learned and that I, one of the reasons why I love this painting so much and it speaks to my heart is that you said you learned to see yourself the way that Christ sees you. Yes. Okay. So trying to learn to see the way that Christ sees you, it implies that something was lacking, Mm -hmm. right? That you weren't seeing yourself the correct way. Right. So what was lacking, Kate? Everything, (laughs) really everything, really everything. I didn't feel like I was succeeding in any part of my life at all. Like nothing. Like I wasn't a good wife. I wasn't a good mom. I wasn't a good person. I wasn't good at my calling. I wasn't good at like decisions. I wasn't good at speaking or drawing or like my whole life. Like I just everything. I wasn't good at anything is what I thought. So how have you begun to see yourself the way that Christ sees you? What helps you? Like I said earlier, I stopped telling myself the negative. 
I stopped believing the lies and I started accepting. I mean, I had to be humble and I know that that that's like a conscientious choice, right? Yeah. Where you're like, I got to stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you know Hmm. how it feels when, when you tell yourself or when somebody else says something negative to you, you just like get lower and lower and lower or that cloud, that yucky, heavy cloud just pushes down on you, you know? And I was just done feeling that way. And so I stopped and it was hard because it was a habit, but I stopped and I really had to humble myself. And I had to like get mad at myself and not just like you stop it. It was like full on, give myself a lecture, stop being so mean to yourself. God doesn't want that for you. And and you're not meant to live this way. You're meant to feel joy. So allow yourself to feel joy. So what would you say to somebody who feels that they aren't enough to help them understand how Christ sees them? I would say that I understand. It's hard. I understand that it might feel more comfortable to keep yourself in the negative. It might feel like that's a safer place to be because it's hard to accept positivity, especially when you're so used to the negativity, but you need to look yourself in the mirror and you need to see who God sees, really who God sees. And you need to allow yourself to feel that. I've said this before, the noise of Satan is always going to be noisy, but the music of Christ is so much better and so much sweeter. Find scriptures that speak to you, that lift you, that help you to feel loved. Like there are so many and we can give you a list of them. Um, But one of my favorites is Doctrine and Covenants 1810. When he says, remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. I love that because that's God talking to us. And he's saying, hey, remember, I love you. And your soul is great. Who you are has purpose. And those are things that I've had to talk to myself through and remind myself over and over and over. And I think if you are feeling that way and you're struggling with this, find scriptures that you can repeat to yourself over and over and over until your soul understands the truth because you need that. You need to know that and you're not worthless and God doesn't see you that way. And Christ doesn't see you that way. And they never have, and they never will. You're just too good. Keep pushing forward. Well, I think that's so important to find those things that connect us to heavenly father, that we can turn out the noise and focus Mm -hmm. on how he sees us. That was one of the very first challenges President Nelson gave us as a prophet was have you asked God how he feels about you? Yeah. And to try and live in that every day is hard. Yes. But we need to do those things to constantly remind us how he feels about us. Yeah. Because Satan's going to do the opposite. Yeah. Seriously. He's relentless. He's never going to let up on that. So keep pushing back on Satan, right? Like we fight hard and we have God on our side. So we can fight hard. You know, even in those hard moments, we can fight hard. Well, I love that. And I think that goes right along with that third lesson that you've said you've learned from this painting. You've shared that you learned to fully turn to him and allow him to illuminate your journey. Mm -hmm. Kate, what does it mean for God to illuminate your journey? That word illuminate is such a descriptive word to me. It just means automatic light. I think it's again, in those just everyday moments when we invite God and our savior in our lives, that is what I think of that's illuminating our lives, our paths, our our everyday moments. We talked about the mundane things, right? When we include God in those moments, but then we also have the triumph moments and we also have riding our mountain bike moments and, and just inviting God to be a part of those moments. That is God illuminating our lives because we're allowing him to be in every moment of our lives. So good. And I actually love that part of the painting where she is kneeling before the savior and her hands are stretched out and his hands are stretched out. And to me, that that's like a verb going on there. Like that's action. So tell me about what you're trying to portray there. I love this part. I love that you asked that because this is like one of my favorite things to talk about because like you look at the painting, right? And they're sitting together like that. And her hands, if you notice this, her hands are above Christ's hands, right? And Christ are right under hers. He's not holding them up, but he's supporting her. He's like right under her hands. Right. And she is like yeah. looking down at her hands and she is understanding who she is through the different experiences of her life. 
Like she's learning who she is as a daughter of God. She's learning her potential. She's learning what she can do. Her purpose is all of that stuff she's learning. And then Christ is just there. He's like, I'm here. I'm with you. I get it. He's going to be there with us like that always. Because we're always going to be learning. And he's like, okay, hey, awesome. You know, I'm here and we're going to keep going forward. It's almost like she has to accept it. Yeah. Right? It's almost like she has to accept who who she is, right? Yeah. Christ is never, ever going to force that light on us, ever, because that's just not how he works. But as soon as we accept it, as soon as we're willing to allow him in, that's when it's like, it just takes off. So, Kate, we love to end every episode of Magnify with a small and simple challenge, like something that we can do throughout the week to help us feel more of Christ's love and his light. So before we end today, what is one small and simple way we can let Christ light into our life this week? Okay. So first I thought about this because I think I know what I do, (laughs) but I think that this question, anybody who's listening should take time to reflect on this question because I think it's going to be different for everyone. For me, it is something that, you know, I have to learn to give myself grace in every moment, because that's something I did not do ever until I got older, you know, until 2016, I feel like is when I started to give myself grace. I feel like when I've done that is when the pressure has come off. When I give myself grace, it's almost like those negative words are afraid of that. And so they just go away, you know, and not completely, but it's lighter. And so I would say, give yourself grace in every moment of your day because it's okay to be human. And God knows it's okay to be human. Right. And it's his grace. Yes, it is. <laughs> Kate, thank you so much for being here. I thank love you, my friend. Oh, I love you too. I miss you. I am so grateful for my friend, Kate, that she was able to share some time with us and some thoughts on what it means to let Christ truly illuminate your path. I believe if we can tune into the light and look for God's hand and be intentional about looking for God's hand, we will see his hand in our life and that his light truly can dispel any darkness. Thanks for being here and hop on over to Instagram at Magnify Community for more inspiration and conversation. And of course, subscribe and listen to the Magnify podcast wherever you get your shows. Let's meet up again next week.